Hello, welcome. You are listening to the Pure Strategies Conversations webinar series. We are so excited to offer these unique discussions to help you transform your business to create a more sustainable future. I'm Melanie Fleming, Marketing Manager for Pure Strategies. Our team provides sustainability consulting to companies looking to develop goals, enhance their sustainability programs, and implement changes in their products, packaging, and supply chains. We are offering these webinars to help companies advance environmental and social performance in their business, helping to show the possibilities for change and empower you with insights from those at the forefront. You can find our past webinars, research reports, and resources on our website, purestrategies.com, including information about work we have done for 7th Generation, Walmart, Ben & Jerry's, and other sustainability leaders. Your host today, Natalie Kaner, Sustainability Advisor for Pure Strategies, is part of our consulting team that has been providing custom sustainability solutions to corporate clients for over 20 years. During this 30-minute webinar, Natalie will be talking with Britt Langren, Senior Director of Sustainability and Government Affairs at Stonyfield. Together, they will discuss the company's sustainable and organic agricultural work and engagement with the evolving regenerative agricultural space. They will also share insights on Stonyfield's leadership role in Open Team and their work to integrate tools for measuring soil health and climate impacts into farm management systems. Britt has more than 15 years of experience working to advance agricultural sustainability through policy and supply chain initiatives in both the nonprofit and business sectors. Britt also serves on the board of the Organic Trade Association and the Sustainable Food Lab. We aim to have time at the end of their conversation to cover your questions. The audience will be muted, so please provide your questions in the Q&A field. I'll ask as many questions as time will allow. The recording of this session will also be posted on the Pure Strategies website. And now I'd like to hand it off to Natalie. All right, thank you, Melanie. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, and thank you, Britt, for joining us. Um, it's great to see you. And I've really been looking forward to this conversation to chat about your work at Stonyfield and Metallic US Yogurt. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thanks, Natalie. It's great to be here. So I think before we dive into some of the topics that Melanie was mentioning in the introduction, um, I think it'd be great if we could start with you sharing an overview of your role at Stonyfield and just give us a bit more background on how you shaped the company's agricultural sustainability programs um, during your, you know, your many years at the company. Sure, glad to. Um, so currently, I am the Senior Director of Sustainability for Lactalis U.S. Yogurt, which includes Stonyfield, Siggy's, and Commonwealth Dairy. And in that role, I oversee all of our work to advance sustainability across those businesses. And that includes, you know, our, our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make progress towards Stonyfield science-based target. Um, while also expanding those efforts to the other businesses that are within Lactalis U.S. Yogurt. I've been with Stonyfield for over a decade now, and for most of that time, my role has been in um, focused on sustainable agriculture and working with the organic dairy farmers that supply milk to Stonyfield to um, improve the sustainability of that milk um, in, in a big picture way, you know, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also looking at things like how do we ensure the future, the next generation of organic dairy farmers can get started in our region so that we ensure the long term um, sustainability of our supply and things like that. So it's been um, an opportunity to work across a lot of different aspects of our business. Yeah. And I, I can speak to personally of how much, what a breadth of work that you cover in your role, um, having spent a little bit of time at Stonyfield. Um, and I'm really excited to dive into some of the topics that you mentioned, some of the exciting things you're working on. Um, before we dive in, I think for folks who may not be as familiar with Lactalis U.S. Yogurt and, and Stonyfield specifically, 
Could you provide just um, a little bit of context on your milk sourcing model? Sure. So I'll speak specifically to Stonyfield because that's where most of our work is from a sustainability standpoint. And that's the, the biggest part of the Lactalis U.S. yogurt business. Stonyfield sources most of our milk from the Organic Valley Cooperative, which uh, they're headquartered in Wisconsin, but um, we have a real regional emphasis in our sourcing because we do most of our manufacturing in Londonderry, New Hampshire. So we want that milk to be coming from as close as possible to our plant. So we get milk from about 200 farms that are in Organic Valley's cooperative that are within the Northeast region, the New England states plus New York and a little bit of Pennsylvania. And then um, we have what we call our direct supply program. And that uh, today includes 34 farms in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Eastern New York that contract directly with Stonyfield. And one of the fun things about having the direct supply is it has given us uh, more, um, a, a more direct connection to some of the farms that we work with where we can be more collaborative with them on how they do things like address greenhouse gas emissions from their farm and improve their overall sustainability. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna dive more into that, um, but just quickly, you also mentioned that Stonyfield has set science-based targets. Um, could you just for a moment talk about how your ag efforts are contributing to meeting those targets or your plans for that? Yeah, so Stonyfield set our science-based target a couple of years ago um, where our target is to reduce emissions 30% across all three scopes by 2030. And so we have, and that's against a, a 2019 baseline. So no matter how much our business grows between now and 2030, we still have to reduce against that initial baseline. Um, and we have five different action areas within the science-based target um, where we've identified the, the places where we think we have the most room to make an impact. And that you know covers everything from energy and waste and transport all the way to the farm level emissions. And for us, you know, farm level emissions represent over half of Stonyfield's total greenhouse gas footprint. So if we are going to be successful at achieving our science-based target, we really do need to um, make an impact at the farm level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really helpful to hear um, kind of where those hot spots are and how you structured your pillars of how you're making progress towards your science-based target. And, um, that's something we we hear regularly. You know, we know agricultural production is, is such a huge contributor. Um, and so I kind of want to dive into that more. You started to mention um, the collaborative efforts that you have with farms on, you know, trying to tackle greenhouse gas emissions. And I think more and more we're hearing about how agriculture can be part of the solution to combating climate change, as well as helping to regenerate soil health and you know, achieve some of these other target outcomes. Um, and so organic certification has obviously been a core pillar for Stonyfield, you know, since the inception of the company. So it's, you know, this type of thing isn't a new concept to Stonyfield, but I'd love to hear your perspective on kind of this evolving, rapidly evolving space of regenerative agriculture and, you know, how Stonyfield has been engaging with that and how it's intersecting with your efforts in organic production. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, fundamentally, we don't we don't necessarily differentiate between organic and regenerative agriculture. We think that in order to be truly regenerative, you really need to be starting from a foundation of organic agriculture where you're focused on things like building soil health, um, which is a fundamental you know principle of organic agriculture. And if you look um, at, you know, the NRCS principles of what needs to be in place to build soil health, you can draw a direct line between each of those five principles and pieces of the organic regulations and the practices that those regulations require on organic operations. 
And we also see it borne out in the data around um, uh, soil health on organic farms that organic operations have consistently higher levels of carbon stored in the soil because of the practices that are in place on the farm. And um, I think when you, when you look at other definitions of regenerative agriculture, you see a fair bit of variability out there in terms of how businesses or farms are defining regenerative. And um, I think that that's something that needs to be addressed eventually, because if you want consumers to understand a term and value a term, you really have to have consistency behind the meaning of that term. And so far there isn't a whole lot of consistency in how regenerative is defined or the, the broadness of the scope. You know, soil health seems to be a pretty common element of everyone's definition of regenerative agriculture. But beyond that, you know, you can call yourself regenerative, but still be using synthetic fertilizer on your farm, which is made from fossil fuels and, and a big part of agriculture's greenhouse gas footprint. You can call yourself regenerative and still be using synthetic pesticides on your farm, which are killing the microbes in the soil, which are ultimately really fundamental to building soil health and storing carbon. So I think that like we as a community in agriculture have some work to do in how we define and advance regenerative and help, you know, take advantage of the interest in this opportunity to move all farms along a spectrum of management where they can start including more and more practices to move towards a space that's truly regenerative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting that you touched on like how are consumers understanding what regenerative means? I think there's a lot of learning that needs to happen and is continuing to happen around what regenerative actually is. Um, especially given the fact that you're right, there is no definition right now, whereas the organic standard is very clearly defined, um, you know, in the legislature as well. Um, and I think it makes me think of, you know, organic is very much about, um, you know, this practice focus of being clear on what the practices are on a farm. And there's a lot of movement as well towards, okay, now that we, you know, can establish practices, how can we look at outcomes that are coming out of those practices? We've touched on some of those already, um, but more and more companies are getting interested in, in tracking these outcomes in their supply chain related to soil health, sequestering carbon, biodiversity, you know, water, water cycle health. Um, and there's so many different tools and technology systems out there. It, it can be really difficult to navigate this landscape for a company right now or for a farmer. And so um, I'd love to hear more about how Stonyfield has been working to kind of approach and navigate this landscape um, through your open team initiative and, and what you've been working on with that. Yeah, I fully agree with that, that point that you just made that it's so important that we get to a place of outcome-based measurement for understanding the impact that farms are having on, um, on climate change and on other environmental resources. And we've had quite a journey in this area at Stonyfield. When I, um, like, actually, even before I arrived at Stonyfield, I remember one of the like first times that I became aware of the work that Stonyfield was doing in this space. I was still at Environmental Defense Fund at the time, and I remember reading this article in the New York Times one morning in my office about the Greener Cow Initiative that Stonyfield launched, where they were feeding um, flaxseed to cows and, um, and they were um, observing that it was helping to reduce enteric fermentation. So they, um, they were looking to use flax as a supplement that would reduce methane emissions from cows, which are on organic operations represent about half of the total greenhouse gas emissions from the farm. So it's a, a really big piece of emissions. And, um, when I got to Stonyfield, of course, you know, there's a lot of excitement about this, that we had done these initial trials and seen the model showing that the um, emissions were being reduced from the cows. And, and we were kind of asking the question like, okay, how do we do this with all the farms that are providing our milk? Let's get, let's get everybody on board. This seems great. And I said, you know what, let's like just pause and do a peer review of the model before we proceed here. And, um, and lo and behold, that peer review came back and raised so many questions 
-hmm. about whether the supplements were really resulting in the methane emission reductions that were being predicted by the model. And this sent us down this road of really asking ourselves, um, you know, how are we going to measure our emissions um, from agriculture in a way that was that we could have confidence in the results of those measurement activities that the time that we spent collecting data and measuring would be time that was well spent and that ultimately that all of those efforts would be useful at the farm level and really lead to decision support for farmers because it says that, you know, a company can do all sorts of work to try and understand their footprint, but it, ultimately, if it doesn't help individual farmers make their daily decisions in a way that leads to improved practices and improved results, like we're not, we're all just wasting our time, right? Um, so this led us down this road um, of starting to work with a scientist named Dorn Cox and teaming up with Wolf's Neck Center to launch this project that we call Open Team, which stands for Open Technology Ecosystem for Agriculture Management. So there's like over a decade between this initial greener cow pilot and the launch of Open Team in 2019. But essentially what Open Team is doing is um, building interoperability between the tools that can support farms in record keeping, measuring soil health, and managing other activities on their farm so that they can measure greenhouse gas emissions and track the change that they're making over time. So there's lots of different tools that do pieces of those activities, but those tools are not currently very good at talking to each other. So what mm -hmm. Open Team is doing is creating this community of researchers, bringing them together, building a shared um, platform for data exchange so that we can really enhance the, the usability of all of these tools. Mm -hmm. And the basic motto at Open Team is enter data once, use it many times, right? Like we want a farmer to just like track a piece of information wherever they're gonna track it in their record keeping system and be able to move that information through something we call the Ag Data Wallet which is, you know, I mean, a wallet is like a, a useful analogy here because it's like where all your stuff goes and then it comes back out and it can go wherever you need it to do. It can plug in. And so the wallet is like the central repository that allows farmers to control information and really maximize the benefit that they get from that information. Um, so Open Team is building that technical community and then they're building a community of users, of farmers who are trialing these tools, providing feedback, and then using them in their daily management activities to start reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving soil health. So it's been quite a journey and we spent a lot of time just like trying to help launch the project and, and fund the project, but we've been really pleased to be able to start piloting it in the past couple of years. We have about a dozen farms currently that are helping us to, to trial open team and um, look at you know, how it works on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what I think is so great about Open Team is it is so focused on how do we actually help farmers make informed decisions? How do we bring this back to making their life easier at the end of the day too, which I think is, is so great. And um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, you know, as companies are more and more wanting to see data from farmers, wanting to see outcome-based information, if you have any thoughts on how to navigate, um, you know, farm data ownership and how you guys are approaching kind of um, tracking those results or those outcomes for, for your farmers that you've been working with. Yeah, well, there's a couple of layers to that. And yeah. at the core for Open Team, they are really focused on making sure that farmers have control of their data through the entire platform and they can select who is able to see the data in which tools and they can decide whether or not they want to share their data with researchers or a supply chain or other end users. And I think that that farmer control of their data is really important. Um, we have um, established in our in our direct supply program, we have a relationship with our farmers that we've established where we've made it clear we want to be able to share this data from them so that we can use it to track progress towards the benefits that they're creating and track our own progress towards our science-based target. And 
there, you know, that's like kind of part of working with Stonyfield is that you agree to that. So we have a set of farmers who are amenable to sharing that data. I know that's not always the case, but I think there has to be value in it for the farmer ultimately for them to share that data, right? And we are looking now at, at how does this roll up into an incentive program? Currently, we just pay farmers a flat fee of $2,000 a year to work with us in open team. But over time, I think we expect that, um, that you know we may move towards paying for the benefits that they create instead. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting. I think that's something that you know a lot of companies um, are navigating right now. Of how do we bring farmers along on the journey? How do we incentivize this? You know, obviously the goal is that they're going to see benefits on farm from doing practices, but really, you know, there there needs to be incentives in place. So I think it's interesting to hear that you guys are navigating those questions right now and kind of developing those systems. Um, and so I kind of want to pivot a little bit um, because I think that's something that really makes Stonyfield stand out as a leader in my mind, as a sustainability leader, is its engagement in policy related to organic and sustainable agriculture and climate. Uh, but I know this is something that you've been really close to in your role here, as well as before being at Stonyfield. Um, could you talk a little bit about this intersection of policy advocacy and your supply chain work? And perhaps you know, flag any policies or legislation that Stonyfield has been tracking or, or advocating for. Yeah, Stonyfield has been a longtime advocate for federal climate policy, and we continue to see that as being really fundamentally important towards moving our whole country towards a place where we're addressing climate change in the way that it needs to be addressed. Um, and we are really pleased with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. So we have been advocating for Build Back Better, you know, for a couple of years now. And um, when that turned into the Inflation Reduction Act just a couple of weeks ago, we were there and ready to, um, to push for the passage of that bill. And we're really excited that there's, you know, $20 million in funding in that bill for expanding programs like EQIP and CSP, which will provide incentive to farmers to improve their practices. And um, along with, you know, the expansion of the Renewable Energy for America program. So there's, um, there's some really substantial funding in there that we think will be relevant to the farms that we work with and helping them make progress. Um, but I think it's also so important that we have federal legislation on climate because it's not enough for businesses like Stonyfield to make a commitment to addressing climate change within our own scope. Like if we are gonna actually address climate change in a way that's meaningful for the future of life on earth, we need everybody to be at the table, right? We can't leave folks out. And there are supply chains that are just never going to have that consumer pull, that are never going to be able to have like a premium for the benefits that they're creating. And we need to bring those farmers along too. And so federal programs can help us do that. They're all voluntary. You know, no one's being regulated by this bill, but there are a lot of really strong voluntary incentives in there. And I hope that that starts to create ripple effects as farmers see those things working. Um, because, you know, it's it's not just like that we need to reduce emissions because we need to reduce the impacts of climate change somewhere else. Like on the farm level, many of the activities that a farmer can do to reduce their emissions also improve the resilience of that farm to climate change. So especially when you're talking about soil health, we see this all the time in organic operations that when they've really like improved the soil health in their pastures, their pastures are becoming more resilient to drought and to extreme precipitation events. And, you know, it seems like every year we see more and more that that's just going to be the norm. We're in a drought here in New England this summer. And of course, other parts of the country are getting hit by drought much harder than we are. So farmers need support in adapting to climate change as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're spot on and, you know, that your comment about um, supporting farms to be resilient and, um, you know, supporting farms and adapting. It's, it's making me think of how 
Stonyfield has really made a point to connect to farmers in your region through your direct supply program. And, you know, we know it's a tough time to be a dairy farmer, frankly. And um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how Stonyfield has been working to try to help protect and support um, New England organic dairy farmers and help that industry be um, resilient. Yeah, that's that's a point that's really important for us because in part because of our manufacturing location. You know, if we we have invested a lot in our facility in New Hampshire in recent years. And that to me is, you know, real evidence that we plan to stay, we plan to continue sourcing milk from this region. And so with our direct supply, we have a technical assistance program where every farm has access to up to $4,000 a year that they can use to help bring in outside expertise or make improvements to sustainability on their farm. Um, but then, you know, last year we saw that a large number of farms, it was over 100 farms, um, lost contracts from to major processors in the region. And so we began to look at like, what more could we do to try and ensure that those farms stayed in business? Because we saw that if we lost that, you know, that many organic dairy farms at once from this region, that the ripple effects of that would be really strong for the whole dairy community. And so um, we helped to launch an organization called the Northeast Organic Family Farm Partnership, which is, um, working on raising consumer awareness of the importance of buying regional organic dairy as a way to, to invest in you know, improving the long-term sustainability of this region. And that organization is really focused on just raising consumer awareness about regional organic dairy brands. So um, it goes far beyond Stonyfield. I think we have like 35 different brands that are participating that are sourcing their milk from this region and are getting highlighted by the partnerships efforts um, because we really want to make sure that you know we're in this for the long haul and we want it we want it to be sustainable for not just for us but for the farmers that we're sourcing from yeah yeah i think that's great and um you know talking about having it be sustainable for the long haul supporting farmers you know i know not only are you helping protect um, existing dairy farms in New England, but can you talk about the program that you have in place supporting kind of the next generation of organic farmers as well? Yeah, yeah. So we we teamed up with Wolf Snack Center, which is in Freeport, Maine. It's a nonprofit farm and education center. It also has a lovely campground with oceanfront campsites. If anybody's looking for a last minute getaway in New England this summer, it's it's a great spot to visit. Um, but uh, back when we were launching the direct supply program, we saw that there was this concern around the lack of young people coming into organic dairy. And so we, um, we worked with our parent company at the time to provide a grant to Wolfsnack of $1.6 million that they were able to use to launch a training program for new organic dairy farmers. And they then um, teamed up with the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program, which is a nationwide accredited apprenticeship program for new um, grazing-based dairy farmers. And so they use Dairy Grazing Apprenticeships curriculum and they have a residential program where they have like between three and four apprentices in the program at a time in a two-year program that they get really robust training in how to manage an organic dairy farm. Um, so I was actually just talking this morning with someone uh, who's a farmer. His name is Hayden. He's a graduate of the Wolfsnack program, and he's now part of Stonyfield's direct supply. And it's really gratifying that like we're seeing these folks come through the program and, and get established. Most, most of the graduates are going out and becoming herd managers before they can manage to secure their own operation. But Hayden's Hayden made it all the way there. So we're really proud of him and, and the work that he and Katie are doing. Oh, that's amazing. Such a full circle moment. That's great. That's awesome. Um, well, I feel like there's so much more that we could talk about. We are running up against time. So I'm going to pause there. Um, thank you so much, Britt. And I'm going to hand it back over to, uh, to Melanie to wrap this up. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Britt. This was very, very interesting. And you actually answered some of our questions along the way um, in, as you continued your, your dialogue. So some of the questions that we had or received, you actually did answer them. There is one question I think for you, Britt, here is um, 
How can companies engage on regenerative or sustainable agriculture if they don't have direct sourcing relationships like you do with farmers? I don't know if you could lend any insight to that. Yeah, I think there's different, it, 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 we are lucky in the dairy supply chain that the milk truck goes from the farm to our plant. We know who our farmers are, but I think that companies at least know um, the region that they are sourcing from. And there are a lot of interesting landscape scale initiatives that are springing up in different parts of the country and different parts of the world where companies are working together with um, nonprofit organizations that work with farmers in different regions to try and establish um, ways to just make progress across a landscape, whether it's a watershed or a county or a broader sourcing region. I think that companies um, need to be looking at how they participate more widely in the systems that they're sourcing from. Because it may also be that like you're sourcing corn, but the answer to improving sustainability on those corn and bean operations is to include more crops in the rotation, right? And those might be crops that you don't need um, for your own products. And so how do we take a systems approach as businesses to work with each other and work with regions and organizations and regions to really move the ball forward? Great. Thank you. Well, I can't believe it's already 1231. So um, I'm afraid we don't have any more time for questions, but certainly if anyone has further questions, you can send them to me at info at purestrategies.com and I will gladly get back to you with some answers. Um, but that is all the time that we have for today. We hope that you enjoyed our conversation on regenerative agriculture with Stonyfield. A warm and special thank you to you, Britt, today, and to you, Natalie, for your time and insights today. Very thoughtful, very interesting. Um, be sure to check our website or sign up for our newsletter for details about our next webinar with Tazo and their regenerative approach. Our website offers additional resources that might be of use for your work, or feel free to reach out to Natalie directly. We look forward to connecting with you again or having you attend our next Pure Strategies Conversations webinar in September. Stay well, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thanks, Brett. Take care. Yep.